like to call the June 13th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting to order. And um, with that, I would like to ask uh, my uh, co-chair, Mike, if you could lead us in a flag salute, please. Thank you, Mike. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Clerk, if we could do a roll call, please. Commissioner Dever. Commissioner Santos. Here. Commissioner Steinbach. Here. Commissioner Stevens. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Commissioner Stevens. Here. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Here. Vice Chair Graff. Here. And Chair Camarada. Yes, here. All the present. Okay, thank you. Um, before we start, I just want to announce a quick fun fact that the last time we've had our planning commission in person was March 9th of 2020. So welcome back to the in-person meeting. Just a little fun fact. Okay, uh, item number two, oral communications. Persons wishing to address the planning commission on subjects other than those are requested to do so at this time. Please provide your name and address for the record. In order to conduct a timely meeting, we have established a five minute time limit. And uh, Madam Clerk, have you received any comments regarding any items not on tonight's agenda? No, I've received no uh, request to speak. Okay. And uh, is there anybody in the uh, audience wishing to comment on the, uh, on the uh, uh, non items on, a on the tonight's agenda, whether in person or on the uh, on the on the uh, virtual meeting. No, okay. Okay, item three consent agenda, we're going to do the approval of the May 9th 2022 minutes. And uh, if I may have a motion and a second to approve the consent so moved. Agenda minutes. Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please conduct a roll call? Commissioner Devitt. Commissioner Santos? Yes. Commissioner Steinbach? Yes. Commissioner Stevens? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Vice Chair Graff? Yes. And Chair Camarada? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Item number four, uh, city manager update regarding city response to SB9. And uh, it looks like our City manager is here, Ryan. Yeah, it's nice to join you guys, especially in person. And welcome back to in-person meetings. It is a, uh, it is a change for sure, and I can understand. Um, Kathleen, if you would, the next slide for me. Um, <clears throat> actually, the next one too. There you go. Um, so Sherry and I have obviously been talking a lot about a lot of these state laws that have been coming down, and I know you guys are dealing with the brunt of a lot of these laws and the changes that we are required to make with those and. Um, and have been for quite some time. After your last meeting, I understand there was a number of questions and we do, I mean, it might be surprising, but we do actually watch those and, and listen to the comments that you guys make and the, the council does as well. There was two uh, real strong questions that I got from you all out of your last meeting, um, pretty loud and clear. Number one, um, how is Lamita pushing back, if you will, on some of these state laws that you all are so familiar with come down from Sacramento? Number two, knowing that we are required to comply with those laws, what are we doing to mitigate some of the impacts of those laws? So I asked Sherry if I could, although I don't normally come to your meetings because it's really not my domain, I felt like this is something you should hear from, from me and frankly, um, speaking on behalf of the city council, hear about some of the efforts that they are taking. Because while you guys may not always see the, the efforts that the city council makes, believe me, they are, um, as frustrated as anybody else with some of the efforts from Sacramento and are working their tails off to um, help craft some of these laws, at least as much as we possibly can. So I heard that pretty loud and clear from you guys, and I wanted to take the opportunity to walk you through some of their efforts a little bit, if you would allow me to do so. so next slide for me, Kathleen. So 
by way of background, and some of you are probably pretty familiar with this already, there are two general types of cities in California. Um, number one is a general law city, which Lomita is, and the other type of city, the structure is a charter city. Um, a general law city is generally bound by the state's laws. We have to work within their laws, whereas a charter city establishes effectively its own constitution within its boundaries and establishes its own rules with limitations, of course, from the state. Those are established in, in the state constitution. Over recent years, um, and the, the difference being that general law cities generally have to um, have um, the power to regulate things that are, quote, municipal affairs, and um, charter cities would as well, um, except charter cities, I'm sorry, <coughs> charter cities also have, for the most part, the power to regulate things within their boundaries. But if the state, when they set regulation, determines that something is a matter of statewide concern, and you'll see that language in legislation a lot, that this matter, this is a matter of statewide concern, often those things apply to charter cities as well. So they're basically saying this is a matter that the state needs to deal with because it's so important that we need to deal with it within every city across the state, including charter cities. So regardless of whether it's a matter of statewide concern, the state can regulate general law cities. If it's a matter of statewide concern, they can also regulate within charter cities themselves. Does that make sense? Am I being clear enough on that? So what we've seen, there used to be a lot of benefits to being a charter city in contracting, for instance, in um, building code, and I mean building code as far as purchasing and how we bid out projects for that we have as the city, there was benefiting a charter city in that. A lot of those over time have sort of been eroded away because the state has started to say, these are matters of statewide concern and need to be addressed. Um, the example I gave here is AB5, the independent contractors law that the state put forth, that they determined that that was a matter of statewide concern and therefore also applied to charter cities. Um, and I think you're seeing the, the frustration that you all are feeling is the state is doing that with a lot of housing uh, related bills as well, which is what we're seeing. Next slide for me, Catherine. Um, so this is an example, the language you see here on this slide, uh, the legislature finds and declares that the uh, that ensuring access to affordable housing is a matter of statewide concern and not a municipal affair. Basically, they're saying this applies to all cities and not just charter cities. This is actually the language directly out of uh, SB9, and this comes into play in some of the litigation I'm going to discuss in just a minute. Next slide for me, Kathleen. So um, currently, right now, in this legislative session, there are more than 70 housing related bills that we're monitoring our lobbyists in Sacramento are monitoring and all of the organizations that we're a part of about are all monitoring just related to housing that's not counting all of the other stuff that we pay attention to. And the list you see here I won't go through each of them, but this is just a small list of some of the bills related to housing that have passed in recent years that I know you've all seen, which is why I won't go into too much detail with them. And it's a lot of which you're dealing with currently, in fact, tonight. Um, an example of one that's not on here that didn't pass and probably didn't pass in large part because of city's efforts was uh, SB 50. Some of you who were on the commission a number of years ago may remember that one. That was actually Senator Weiner, um, the same Senator who proposed SD9, SB 9, previously had proposed SB 50, which would have had pretty drastic effects on housing stock within Lomita as well. Fortunately, that bill was defeated and other bills have come along to take its place, but um, we're still dealing with the effects, but an example of a success on, the, on behalf of cities that isn't listed here. Next slide for me, Kathleen. So um, in Lomita specifically, the city council annually adopts a legislative platform. We have a legislative committee of the council, which is council member Waite and council member Warnick at the moment. Um, and they will review our legislative platform in coordination with the legislative platforms of the California Contract Cities Association, the League of California Cities, which is now Cal Cities, and a litany of other agencies and their legislative platforms. And we'll try to tailor it to those things that we might say, yeah, we agree with those things. We'll kind of coordinate here. But on these things, we probably need to do something specific to Lomita. 
So a couple of the housing related items that I pulled out of the, this year's legislative platform that the city council approved um, are listed for you here. Um, we support legislation that maintains and strengthens cities authority over land use decisions. Uh, we oppose legislation that erodes the ability of cities to condition and or deny projects um, <clears throat> based on mitigation factors. We support legislation that creates more equitable regional housing needs assessments, the, um, the arena numbers you've all been dealing with and discussing so much. Um, we support obviously additional funding for sources and sources of funding for cities to provide affordable housing. That's always the question of if we're going to be in business of approving and building affordable housing, where does the funding for those things come from? So this is just to show that the city council is watching these things from a holistic perspective and annually gives us direction as their staff to be monitoring these things specifically. The reason this is helpful for us as staff is normally if we were to take a position on a particular piece of legislation, SB9, for example, we would bring a letter to the council, which means we might have to wait two weeks to get that letter out. We adopt this legislative platform so that we have sort of an expedited process. If we can say um, this bill is clearly in opposition to the city council's stated policies, we'll send that letter out immediately and we can start contacting our legislators and engaging with them to support or oppose whatever that legislation might be. And we do that, and you'll see some examples of that here too. Next slide for me, Kathleen. So this is what you can't read it on the right, but this is just one of the letters, one of the many letters that we sent to our legislators regarding SB9. And we were opposed to that, that piece of legislation in particular from the beginning of it, regardless of what any of the iterations were of it. We were continually opposed to that. And I've pointed out um, two of the main ways and a third, which we'll discuss in a little more detail in a bit, um, our advocacy efforts, not just with SB9, but with regard to housing bills or any other bills come from a number of angles. We obviously do it in coordination with other cities and other organizations. Um, SCAG is one that we are intricately involved in. In fact, Councilmember Gaisley uh, represents the cities of Lomita and Torrance and Carson, I believe. Is that right, Sherry? I think Jim represents Lomita, Carson, and Torrance, right? Or Skag? And, um, and actually has been a vocal advocate for changes to the RENA process and the system where, by which they calculate our, our allocation numbers. Um, Councilmember Warnick is also involved in Skag from a number of angles. Um, Councilmember Warnick was the uh, president of the California Contract Cities Association, which is probably one of the strongest voices we have in Sacramento on some of these laws, um, has put in fairly significant effort on a lot of these on behalf of uh, mostly Southern California cities. Um, Cal Cities, obviously the league. Um, Cal Cities is a statewide organization, keeping in mind, um, obviously Lomita and a number of cities like that, like us, in fact, the vast majority of cities in the state were opposed to SB9 specifically. Obviously there are some cities that were not opposed to that. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why, but that's the position they took. Um, so Cal Cities tends to be, um, they're representing organizations across the state. So they tend to you know, walk that line a little bit as they have to. Um, whereas contract cities and SCAG are more regional and can probably closer represent the views of Lomita. So we work with them pretty closely. And then obviously the SBC COG, the South Bay COG, um, we work with them regularly. And that is council member Gaisley and council member Waite that are involved in that uh, on an intricate basis. They're actually pushing some legislation at the state level currently for a housing trust fund, which we are conceptually in support of. Um, the devil will be in the details in that and we'll work through that as we get there, but it may be a method by which we might be able to provide some funding for affordable housing to make some of these, these projects start to pencil out. So that's one area that regionally here in the South Bay, a number of cities are getting together and saying, we know we have to comply with the laws. What's the best way can we do it? We can do it. And how can we get the state to maybe pony up some funding to make it happen and make it happen well? And then obviously, independently um, here, just as Lamita, we have direct advocacy to our legislators. Our council members have uh, very good relationships with our legislators. Um, we have, um, we invite them out here to Lamita on a regular basis. We go up to Sacramento and meet with them in their offices on a regular basis. Um, we have a 
a number of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, we brought in a lobbyist specific in Sacramento, um, Gonzalez and Son, and they work, they only work with cities. They only represent cities and cities' interests. So they're, they are a strong voice with the legislat legislature up in Sacramento. And then just this year, actually, we've brought in Kylie and Associates, who is a, a federal lobbying firm, because some of these things are starting to become federal questions that are being asked. And so we're, uh, along with a number of other projects we're working on, we're having those conversations with our federal legislators as well. And then obviously I've talked about the city council and their legislative committee working down here locally on a regular basis. We actually, um, we send them weekly updates as to what the legislation is going on up in Sacramento and what the status of each of those 70 housing bills is. Um, and then the last piece of this is obviously the legal question. So when all of those other things are, I won't say failing, but perhaps not going the directions we always want them to, um, there's always a legal question that, that and, and an avenue that we can explore and we monitor pretty closely. And I'll get into some of that in a bit here too. Next slide, Kathleen. So these are just a couple of quick examples about the collective advocacy efforts. This is one um, that's actually a, um, an op-ed that California Contract Cities put out to the LA Times and all of our local and regional newspapers um, opposing SB9. I know it's difficult to read there. We'd be happy to send it to you guys if you wanna do that. Um, and just one of, the, one of the efforts that they did on a regional Southern California basis to explain why cities find local control to be so important and why bills like SB9 we see as so detrimental to that local control. Um, and there's, this one was written by Marcel Rodarte, who is the executive director of Contract Cities. There was also one written by Frank Zerunyan from Rolling Hills Estates, who is um, intricately knowledgeable when it comes to housing issues in California. He has a wealth of knowledge and a great resource to contract cities and to the South Bay. And he, he's written similar pieces um, for regional distribution as well. Um, the other one is a article from the League of California Cities, basically saying, this is the contingent of cities, 240 cities across the state of California are opposed to this, to this bill and coming together to actively fight against it. And yet it was still adopted and, and signed into, into law. Next slide for me. Um, again, small examples, a couple of letters from contract cities, um, a newsletter item that we've done here in Lamita, because part of the effort that we make here in Lamita isn't just talking to you guys, because we kind of feel sometimes that the public needs to see these things and see what's happening as well, because if there is to be change, it needs to come through the public. They need to understand what this means for their communities. It's why um, Sherry and the planning team have put so much effort into the housing element process and getting that public input and as much as we possibly can, getting people to understand what this actually means for their community. And that when we have to do these things, it's not necessarily a decision of the city. It's a decision of the state with which we have to comply and we have to make it into the puzzle piece that is Lomita. Um, so th that's a couple of newsletter items. We have our hard copy newsletter, which you all get, I'm sure, and our e-news, which I would say, I I'm assuming all of you are signed up for. If you're not, you should get that, and you should encourage others to do so, because that's every two weeks we'll be putting the we put those ones out. Um, and then some social media, that's just a, a quick one. We rely on contract cities and some of those regional organizations to do these advocacy, direct advocacy efforts out to the community that we will then share through social media if we're able to do so. So that's just one of the examples that they, the contract cities have put together regarding SB9 specifically. Next slide, Kathleen. Um, I think it's important to note through a heck of a lot of conversations from our council members and, and others, of course, to our representatives, both um, uh, Assembly Member Muratsuchi and Senator Allen, neither of whom provided um, support for SB9. That's an important note because uh, there was a lot of pressure at the state level 
to gather support for that bill. And, and neither of our two representatives provided their support for that bill, which I think is an important, important note for the South Bay and for us specifically. And, and George, I see your hand there. We'll come, to, come back to you in just a second, if you don't mind. Um, like I said, we bring our legislators down here so they can actually see that when these, these laws are passed at the state level, they need to see the impact it has on the communities that they're representing. Um, specifically here in Lamita, we're a different beast. We're a different organization. We're a different community than a lot of the communities around us. A lot of what the state is pushing for already exists in Lamita in a lot of ways, and yet we're being forced to do more. So I think it's, we think it's important for them to come down and actually see that firsthand. And they're, they've been open to that and willing to come down and do that with us. So we're doing that both at the state level and also at the federal level. Um, in fact, we're already reaching out um, in anticipation, assuming that Ted Lou may be our representative going forward. We've already reached out to his office saying, if and when, we'd like you to have some background. So while we're still working with Maxine's office at the federal level, we are also working with, with um, Congressperson Liu's office is to make sure he understands that as well. Um, and I, I, it is important to note the council has um, found the um, representation in Sacramento to be important enough to continue to fund that. And then most recently with Kylie and Associates at the federal level. And then all of the social media and newsletter outlets that I've mentioned previously. Next slide for me, Kathleen. Um, this is an interesting one from an advocacy perspective. Um, you've, you've all probably seen this in some form at some point, the Brand Huang Mendoza uh, initiative uh, that the city council actually took and passed a resolution to support that initiative, um, which would have pushed back on some of these and actually would have amended the California Constitution to um, provide some clarity regarding local control. Unfortunately, I don't believe that that is going forward, but these are the kind of efforts that we're making here and a lot of our cities around us are making as well. Next slide. So this is one I know you guys have all seen. There's been a couple of legal challenges to SB9 specifically. Um, first, and this is why I mentioned the charter cities versus general law cities question mark previously. Um, the first litigation, the, in fact, the only litigation that's been filed with regard to SB9, and I'll leave it to Pat if he needs to jump in here on some of this, but um, is, has been filed by the cities of Torrance, Carson, Whittier, and Redondo Beach. And that litigation is specific to charter cities and, it, and deals with their authority as charter cities. There has been some conversation uh, about similar litigation with regard to general law cities. Um, that litigation has not materialized yet, but it's something our city attorney's office is watching pretty closely. Um, and we as staff are watching pretty closely. In fact, I've had a couple of conversations with some of our surrounding city managers and city managers from the Gateway Cities Council of Governments and other contract city city managers about any interest there may or may not be in pursuing some type of litigation. Obviously, any litigation the city enters into comes along with fairly significant costs and other question marks. And it's something that the council will have to consider and toss back and forth if that's something you wanna jump off to with, with whatever the merits of that litigation may be. But that hasn't been filed as of yet. Yeah, Mike. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes, those are all charter cities and their litigation specifically revolves around their authority as char charter cities. Mm -hmm. Right, you, um, if the city council wanted to do something like that, it, it would be as a general law city, obviously, um, and it would take an entirely different form. And uh, it would be difficult for Lamita to do that independently. In fact, it would be difficult for any city to do that independently, especially small cities. But the more that cities can band together and have a collective voice, you can do that. Now, there's probably a a, some question as to whether those cases individually um, have sufficient merits to go forward or whether if they were combined, they have sufficient merits to go forward. That's all to be discussed going forward, but um, that it, with regard to general law cities specifically, it's just not there yet. But it is something 
um, I can tell you our council is watching closely and the city attorney's office and our staff are watching pretty closely. Hi, I just want to remind you to make sure your mics are on because we can't hear you. I can hear you, Ryan, but sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> the joys of being back in person. We got to get used to it again. <laughs> um, so to wrap this up, I, I want to show you guys, I, I wanted to make this presentation to show that the council is is feeling the same feelings I think I'm hearing from all of you. And um, and we as staff are working in the city manager's office are working pretty closely with our planning teams when we're crafting the ordinances that are coming to you all and will be coming to you all because trust me there's more to come. Um, we are crafting them in a way that mm -hmm. we feel tightens the reins as much as we possibly can while still um, while still um, complying with state law. And I, and I say that not to say that we're anti-development or to say that we don't want projects to happen. I say it from the perspective of mitigation. Um, so these are just some of the ways that we look at mitigating the impacts. When I know you all talk a lot about um, parking impacts and um, setbacks and those types of impacts. But there's, I know you all are seeing this as well, but there's also sewer impacts, there's water system impacts, there's street impacts, there's environmental impacts, all of these things we have to take in consideration as these projects are going, we have to plan for our water systems 50 years from now. So um, we'll go into a little bit here of just some of the ways we're doing that, because I think that's the, uh, the secondary part of the question that I think you all have been asking. If you would, next slide for me, Kathleen. So when it comes to mitigation, we look at this in sort of two ways. One, um, how are we mitigating some of these impacts in the immediate? And then how are we mitigating some of these impacts over the next 50 years? Um, so in the immediate, we're encouraging development that's both consistent with state law and compatible with the community here. Um, and, uh, and our local regulations, our existing local reg regulations to the maximum extent we can under the state law. And that what we mean by that is um, we can craft regulations that both meet the state's goals. For instance, with SB9, what you have before you this evening, um, the state's stated goal is to increase the availability of affordable housing. In our opinion, SB9 was written um, without a direct regard to affordable housing, without a direct requirement for affordable housing. So we've said within our ordinance, why can't we craft that to say if you're going to do this number one we want you to do it well and we want you to design it well and number two meet the state's goal make it an affordable unit two reasons for that number one it's meeting that goal and it's complying with state law but we also think it's um, mitigating some of the ability of a large-scale development firm to come in and buy out a small lot just develop it to something that doesn't fit within the community and sell it off or rent it out it's at least saying, if you're going to do this, and you may have the ability, the state says you have the ability to do it, but if you're going to do it, you're going to do it on our terms. So that's just a small example of a way that we might be able to do that. Another way we're doing short term mitigation specific to parking, it would be, um, we have our own parking and code enforcement officers, we've actually been increasing those efforts pretty significantly over the last couple of years, we now have, I don't know if you all have met him or not, but will, he's a fantastic code enforcement officer, he's been doing great work for us. And he's helping us address some of the impacts from projects that are have happened over many years and that are going in now. So that's been a, a successful effort from my perspective. And then obviously um, the updates to your regulations and ordinances that are coming and will be coming. We'll be developing design standards into those so that when these projects come, they're actually designed well. We want to make sure that if you're allowed to do them, you're designing them in the way that actually fits in the community. You're not just building a giant box and plopping it down on a lot. Next slide for me. Um, over the longer term, I think the council in recent years has um, come to some recognition of their necessity to look beyond the immediate. And they are looking at an update, a comprehensive update to our general plan in the next few years. Now, from the staff perspective, that gives us a little bit of deer in the headlights because that is a daunting task. And trust me, for you all, it will be a daunting task as well. Um, it is a, a 
long and involved and intentionally long and involved process. Um, but we're looking at doing that. It hasn't been done in Lamita for a number of years now, and, and we think it's about time we do that. So last year, the council um, established a general plan update fee on all permits that are issued within the city so that over time we can start to build up some funds for the next time we have to do this. Um, but knowing that wasn't necessarily going to be enough to do it this time, the council set aside $100,000 in last year's budget to start a fund specific to that purpose, to just get the, get the ball rolling and get some of that funding available to make that happen. And then actually at mid-year last year, they dedicated another 100,000 to that. In the proposed budget that we're proposing for um, the next two fiscal years, because this time we're actually doing a two-year budget, we have two, 200,000, I think, in each of those fiscal years towards this process as well. Um, so that puts us at the end of that budget cycle with about six six hundred thousand dollars into that fund, which is still not enough to get that done, but it's a significant start for such a short period of time. To me, that shows the council's commitment to knowing we need to plan this out well if we're going to be if we're going to be looking at these things, we need to make sure that we're we're looking further than just reacting and we're planning for the future. At the same time, you've probably seen the council in recent past updating their water master plan. And we're actually looking at a sewer master plan as well. Let's keep in mind in Lomita, we actually own our sewers. The sanitation district maintains them, but we own them. So um, we're looking at a sewer master plan for that. And then all of the other master plans that we have all go into this whole process of planning these things out and, and give us the ability when we're looking at ordinance changes to say, the council has approved these plans so that we can craft ordinances around them and make sure that as we're changing to comply with state law, we're also changing things to push towards what we're looking to do. Um, the other piece of this, which we've had some initial discussions with, um, first of all, and I'll flip these around, are some increases to our development impact fees. This is a, a pretty significant step that I think we'll be taking a good hard look at in the very short future here, the very near future, because frankly, if we look at some of our impact fees, they're extremely low. For instance, our uh, per unit development impact fee, I think is $1,000 per unit for residential, which is incredibly low. Um, there are a number of impacts associated with all of the new residential units we are and will be required to build. Um, public safety, parks, streets, water infrastructure, that's just a, a start. But those are places that we can start to look to say, you know what, if you're going to build these things, understanding the impacts associated with them and the costs of those impacts, we're going to charge fees appropriate to, to mitigate some of those impacts. And then at the same time, looking at some of the creative financing that is available under state law, for instance, financing districts of various types. And there are a number of different types and ways to do that with each has their own balls of intricacy, I would say. Um, that we'll have to work through, but we're starting to look at those to say, if we're going to allow for this development, um, this development may go into a financing district and pay for those, some of those things over the long term, right? So those are some of the longer term focus that we're looking at at the staff level. Next one, Kathleen. So our goal really when we're presenting some of these ordinances to you all and to the city council is not just to react to the state's laws it's really to plan and try to be ahead of the state's laws knowing that their push is to sort of take cities control over these matters declare them to be matters of statewide concern and frankly usurp the authority that we believe we should have knowing that we want to plan ahead and make sure that if we're going to do that we're going to do it in ways that at least fit within our community as much as we possibly can. So some of the um, the ones we talked about already, the SB9 and the affordability requirement, that's just one small way that, yes, we're complying, but we're going to make sure that you do it, you're doing it appropriately and actually meeting what you say your goal is and not just building density for the sake of density. You're building it for the sake of affordability. Um, inclusionary housing, we've talked a lot about it as part of your housing element discussions and at the staff level we've been talking about bringing those into our ordinance amendments 
ensuring that when developments happen, again, they're actually meeting the affordability requirement and helping us to meet our reunit numbers and not just simply building more units for the sake of more units. And then really, um, when we talk about the housing element, I think it's important to point this out. The housing element process, and again, I know you all are intricately familiar with it because you've been dealing with it, but the housing element process, you all and the council were pretty clear in that. We wanna protect the single family neighborhoods that we have and to the maximum extent possible. There's going to be some changes in those that we simply don't have control over given the state law. Having said that, to where we can, if we have to build new units, we wanna confine them out of those neighborhoods and focus on some of the commercial corridors. So you'll see ordinance amendments for um, Lomita Boulevard, and you guys have talked a lot about the districts on Lomita Boulevard, you know, east and west, and, and Narbonne, north and south. And eventually there's a potential to discuss PCH as we go through the general plan process. And focusing into those areas is specifically designed to protect the residential areas. So when we're seeing density go into those areas, it's kind of a choice. You can have it in those areas or you can have it everywhere. If you wanna protect the, the residential areas that you have, we can choose to put it into those commercial corridors. And that's how those things have been crafted for that specific reason. And then obviously, I think the council um, is on top of us pretty, pretty regularly to continue the regular advocacy with our legislators <laughs> to make it very, very clear um, what Lamita's positions are with regard to the existing state laws and the ones coming through the pipe and, com and coming down. And there are a number of laws, even in this legislative session, that could have significant impacts in Lamita. So we're watching those pretty closely. Um, but I, I think the piece that we can't miss, both at the staff level, at your level, at the council level, is outreach to the community. Because until our community understands the impacts of these things, um, the voice, that's the voice that needs to be heard in Sacramento. We can say it until our tongues bleed, but the, the voice has to come from the residents themselves and come to their representatives in Sacramento to understand what some of these bill, bills are doing to their communities. So you'll, you'll see continued outreach and education from the cities in to, to that effort. Next slide for me, Kathleen. I think that's, that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. I think, I hope you can hear the frustration in my voice as much as it's in yours. Okay, Ryan, thank you so much for that. That was an awesome presentation. I will open it for comments and questions to the commission. So we'll start off with your graph. Uh, yeah, Ryan, thank you very much. It was very enlightening. Is your mic on? It's on. Thank you. Um, it was very enlightening and it, it's good. I'd like to see you do that at least every six months for us. I would be happy to come and speak um, to you. And, you know, no problem because, at all. I mean, it, it's very educational. And um, you mentioned Rena. I, have, uh, I had a question on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion. I read a lot of press about the inaccuracy, if, I, if that's the proper word or not, uh, of the Rena requirements. Have there been any further, have you heard anything further with regard to the fact that those numbers may be revised because of problems or, or inaccuracies that have been made? Uh, I would say it this way. Um, yes, we've heard a lot about the questions regarding the RENA process and the final numbers in those, especially giving some, some of the census data that's come out too. Um, I don't see that those efforts are having a significant impact at the state level. Um, but there has been a heck of a lot of conversation about whether those that process should be revised. Okay, and then I just have one other question or one other statement, I guess. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough today to have a quite a lengthy conversation with Sherry with regard to the impact of SB9 and so on and so forth. And the conversation that I had with her was extremely educational. I know that all of us and the citizens are all very, very concerned about the impact that is being is going to be happening with things being forced down our throat. Um, and it was very educational from the standpoint that she kind of eased my mind a little bit, I guess you would say 
because of the things that the city is doing to implement into our codes to help protect the city rather than just somebody coming in and plopping 100 units down on a small lot. Uh, and I think, I just wish there was some way, even though this conversation was not a real long conversation, I learned a lot and I'm sure there's a heck of a lot more to learn about it, about what the city is doing in an effort. So what I'd like to, and I know it takes everybody's time up and everything, but I'd like to see if there's some way we can figure out how when these things are coming up and there I know there's going to be a lot of regular a lot of uh, zone enforcement you know code enforcement and everything uh, changes um, that it's explained to the extent that everybody understands that the city's just not rolling over to the state law that the city is doing its utmost to protect the city and protect the citizens in this regard. And I hope maybe you guys can figure out a way to, to, uh, to continue that effort, or I say continue that effort, to, to make that effort avail, you know, so that people understand better. I mean, I, I do, I thank you very much, Sherry. What we talked about today was just very, very helpful. And I know there's a lot more uh, as we progress. That's, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Dever, anything? Comments, questions? Okay. Commissioner Santos on the uh, big screen. I just want to thank Ryan for coming in tonight and bringing clarity as to the city's efforts uh, regarding SB9. Uh, I think you did a great job in uh, adding clarity to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Steinbach on the big screen. On the big screen. There you go. Finally made it. Ryan, thanks. I really appreciate it. You know, this is uh, perfect timing because I, as you said, you heard the frustration in our voices in the last few meetings. And this is really great to have this information and to, to know that we're on the same page with, uh, with what council is doing as staff. Uh, the quick question I have is this presentation that you did, is there a way we can get that presentation? I'm sorry, you asked if you could get a copy of it. Is that what you Yeah, yeah. Sure. Electronic absolutely. is fine. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. That'd be we great. That. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I In fact, what, um, what we'll probably do, uh, I'll, I'll talk with the legislative subcommittee and with our staff. Um, we can probably start to include you guys when we do send out some of these letters. We can just blind copy all of you all as well. I mean, they're all publicly available, of course, and we make them available intentionally because we want to educate people as much as we can and we want them to know that we're opposing these things. Um, so we can start to include you all in that, some of that as well so that you see it when we're taking these efforts, you can see the fight that the council is having. And trust me, there's a lot of that going on behind the scenes. Um, I don't know how Jim Mark do it, but they work their tails off to fight some of these things at SCAG and, and with contract cities and some of these other organizations. It is a heck of a lot of work that your council puts in and they do a fantastic job doing it. That's it, Bob. That's it, thank you. Sure. Commissioner Stevens, anything, questions, comments? Yeah, thank you for that, Ryan. I, yeah, it really helped a lot to explain because the misconception is that you know we on the city council are just making these random decisions and not taking into consideration and listening what the populace the residents want so that was that was really good and then i'm going to use this assume word when you're doing the um general plan and doing that that will be open to public discussion as was the housing element i would hope that that's open to as much or far more discussion than the housing element i think um when I say that is a long and intricate process, trust me, it is a long and intricate process and um, frankly, not a cheap process, but it's an important process because that is the plan by which your city lives over the next 20, 30, 40 years. It will be a very detailed process. Thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Thompson, comments or questions on the big screen? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Mr. City Manager. I really appreciate you coming in and putting on the presentation, I was going to ask the same thing. Uh, Commissioner Steinbeck asked if we could get a copy of the PowerPoint, and uh, I look forward to reading that in much more detail. My my main main concern is that our city, um, uh, city council, 
and most, most if not all the cities surrounding us opposed SB9. Our state assemblyman, Al Marasucci, you said opposed, did not vote for it. Uh, and our state uh, senator, um, Ben, what's his last name? Anyway, uh, he, he also voted, he didn't vote for it, yet the thing passed. Uh, that's, that's a great concern to me when we got a huge chunk of Southern California cities, Assemblyman, Assemblyman and State Senator not supporting it, yet it, it still passes. Is that correct? Uh, yes, both of our representatives, Senator Allen and, and Assemblymember Muratsuchi, um, did not vote for SB9. And I say that very specifically. I believe um, Al Muratsuchi voted, specifically voted no, Senator Allen um, abstained from the vote which is a strong position, believe it or not, at the state level to take, um, because in effect, he's saying, I can't take a position on this. This is this is too important to my cities and I cannot vote for this is effectively what he's saying to you all. So I think it's important that neither one of them could lend their support. And, and when I say that there was a lot of pressure at the state level to uh, adopt some piece of legislation and that legislation took the form of SB9, um, I can safely say that they were getting pressured from their colleagues to do so, and, and both of them took a stand against it. So we were pleased to see that. Right, and uh, I know for myself and most all members of the Planning Commission, and certainly our city council, understand that planning, housing, has been uh, traditionally, historically, a local municipal issue, a city issue, and not a county or a state issue. So for the state just to be able to say, hey, it's of state importance, we think it's all, and so we're gonna take control over what has been historically traditional, a local municipal authority causes me great concern as a Californian, as a citizen, as a business owner, as a housing provider. I believe I'm the only one on the commission, maybe a city council that is actively in the business of providing affordable housing. And these, these laws put a tremendous burden on those who are actively trying or engaged in the business of providing very affordable housing. I have entire building of, full of nothing but section eight, which are by de definition, extremely low income people. So I speak from, from experience and actively doing something personal about the uh, providing affordable housing to very, very low income people. And these laws are not helping. They don't help me. They don't help my colleagues. They don't help this. Their uh, usurpation of what has been traditionally and historically a municipal power, and I'm. We have an election coming up. Uh, I'm certainly voting in every election. I voted uh, last week, and I hope uh, other citizens and members of, of the committee and uh, of the commission, rather, and uh, uh, all we can do is vote. And uh, but I'm, I'm pleased to, that uh, uh, somebody Mayor Suchi did not vote for it. I'm pleased that uh, some, uh, Senator, Senator Allen abstained, in other words, did not support, throw a support behind it. Uh, that's encouraging news at, at the very least. But thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager, for your presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time this evening, uh, extra time that, you know, uh, to come here uh, and uh, put, put this very informative presentation as to what the, our city is doing uh, to protect our communities, our residents, and our homeowners. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have one hand up. Uh, I do want to recognize Mr. Kivett in one second, but let me just throw two quick things. First of all, again, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, uh, and number two was, can we get copies, which we've already answered both of those questions. Uh, my only other comment would be, and we've had this same comment in a lot of our own industry presentations, conversations, and so forth, because I'm in the industry that deals with this on another on the side of the fence. Uh, one size does not fit all, and that's the theme that the legislators need to hear is that what the state thinks is right is nowhere near what is accurate down here. They need to get their boots on the ground and they got to figure out, you know, city by city. I know that's not what the state does, but to your point is that one size does not fit all. So with that, we recognize uh, Mr. Kivett who has his hand up. You have a question, George? Uh, well, uh, several questions, comments. Um, and uh, you know, I do feel that we're very fortunate to have a number of electeds on our council that are very familiar with the, the regional efforts to, um, as much as possible, keep local control of our um, housing densities and so forth. Um, and I've spoken before the, the Planning Commission and the City Council on numerous occasions in regards to my views that um, I, I really would like to see as a longtime resident 
of uh, Lameda uh, going on 40 years now, that uh, our residential agricultural areas uh, remain in as close as possible to their pr present densities and that any increased density should go along our uh, transportation commercial corridors. Um, but um, I was wondering what, what organizations, um, I know there's the COG and there's others, is Lameda actively participating with um, you know, as far as any coalitions uh, where motions have been approved to, to join various coalitions and so forth? Well, who are we currently participating with within the region as far as advocacy efforts to keep local control? And I don't need an answer tonight. I could talk offline with the, you know, Ryan or you know, planning staff, what have you, but I'm very interested in that. Um, um, also, um, uh, I, I've received feedback from several in the re recent, um, actually within the past week or so, in regards to our community development department. And I was wondering who is the current executive of our community development part department? Do we have a, a full-time staff person or is there an effort being made to secure a full staff time staff person for our community development department? Because I have received um, this uh, feedback from uh, developers, others in the community in regards to our city department. Um, that is an excellent question, George, and I'm glad you asked it. It actually, I'll take the opportunity to give you a real quick update just generally on okay. city staffing too, but the, specifically to that question. At the moment, Gary, our assistant city manager, is technically acting as the, um, the director of community and economic development. He's wearing a lot of hats at the moment and he's doing a lot of work. Fortunately, okay. mm -hmm. um, we've also had Sherry here um, serving in a number of roles and working on some of these ordinances and things. So she's picking up a lot of that day to day stuff. But um, Gary is our acting director. When it comes to okay. the recruitment specifically, we are currently in in recruitment for that position. In fact, we'll be conducting some interviews in the near future. The recruitment marketplace at the moment is incredibly difficult. I know mm -hmm. we're one industry among um, George, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. They uh, were one industry among many where um, hiring is <clears> difficult <throat> at the moment, and specifically in the planning world, hiring is incredibly difficult at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And that goes more broadly to the city as a whole. Um, we have had some difficulty hiring in recent in recent years, and the council is, and frankly, retaining and attracting high quality employees. Um, We've lost some people over the last few years and we've gained some fantastic employees and we will continue to do so. The council is looking at that from a holistic perspective. They're considering um, compensation packages. They're considering the environment and the workplace mm -hmm. here. Um, and one of those specifically, George, is, is this position, the director position for our community and economic development. I think um, we will probably see some progress in that in the near future. So. Um, be on the lookout, George, I guess is all I can say at the moment. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I, was also, I was also wondering, um, I know Lomita has, you know, various, you know, paid consultants, uh, you know, joining with various coalitions and such, but I was just wondering, uh, who do we have as, uh, you know, uh, uh, consultants, contractors uh, that are paid consultants regarding uh, these residential uh, density issues? And again, uh, yeah, if you can answer it now, otherwise I'd uh, be happy to hear offline. Um, I, well, the city has a number of consultants in any number of areas specific to housing issues. Uh, I mean, I guess we would have consultants, sure. we'd have DUDEC that you all have worked pretty closely with through the housing element process. They've probably been um, one of the most intricately involved, I would say also as consultants from the representation perspective, we have Gonzalez and Son in Sacramento and Kylie and Associates that I mentioned. Um, so those are some of the, the specific ones, but um, although she is not a consultant, she is uh, performing work um, temporarily for us. Sherry is is doing a lot of that day-to-day mm -hmm. -day work. And obviously mm -hmm. our planning team with Laura and Lemesis are, are doing a lot of that for us too. But we, we definitely have a, um, skeleton crew here in Lamita in a lot of areas. I, I'd mm -hmm. take the moment to just point out in public works in the not so distant past, we were down 10 of our 16 positions in public works. That is mm -hmm. devastating for a city our size. And so mm -hmm. we've 
over the last few months started to rebuild that and um that that goes citywide it, it definitely has its impacts so our staff yeah. has picked up a lot of areas that they um that they have just taken on without grumbling and complaining because they know it just needs to get done so kudos to them for doing that we really yeah. appreciate it okay good and uh yeah there was a mention of our uh, water plan and uh, i still have an ongoing concern about uh our cypress street reservoir uh, and its use as a storage vessel in case of a major incident uh, that uh, would involve our immediate area. Uh, and again, I don't need an immediate answer, but I, I just want to be said that I, I am very concerned about that. Uh, the last item I'd want to mention is that you mentioned about letters being sent out uh, regarding um, various um, uh, advocacy efforts and such. Uh, are the citizens able to be copied on those? Yeah, a lot of the, uh, we're careful how we do it because we take things from an education perspective. Um, when we're talking to residents, we're not necessarily advocating for a position one way or the other on any specific thing. We're taking it and saying, hey, here's this bill that's going through the Sacramento process currently. Here's the impacts that we, the city staff might see that it might have on, on the community around you that we think you should know about. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see um, in our e-news, specifically with SB9 we, and SB10, we did um, some e-news items regarding that. Um, we did some of the hard copy newsletters. The difficulty with the hard copy newsletter is it's not the most timely thing in the world because we, we write it out months in advance sometimes for it to go to print and get mailed out to residents. And so when we're reacting to state laws that are coming and, and changing on a weekly if not daily process a daily uh, basis we'd like to be able to get that information out which is why we started the e-news um a number of years mm -hmm. ago when we started it because mm -hmm. it, we can get those out a little quicker in fact we can get them out daily if we needed to although we try not to do that because we don't want to bar bombard people either so but I, mm -hmm. we're open to any other avenues or outreach that um we can do to uh raise awareness about these issues We're, we are entirely open in fact you'll see our city staff out at founders day we're going to have a city booth mm -hmm. out there um, with our staff and um, representatives from our departments out there just to talk through some of these things and sit and answer questions for people we think it's important that we connect with residents that way and obviously founders day is a, a fantastic place to do that so you'll see us out there doing that i'm sure okay, you'll well, george Okay, well, thank you, Ryan. And uh, yeah, as uh, critical as I, I may be at times, uh, I, I really love Lamita, and I think uh, the city, city staff overall does an excellent job. And uh, you know, just uh, do the best you can, and uh, you know, just be as open as you can as far as the communications. Thank you. We, we appreciate it, George. Thanks much. Th thank you, George, for your uh, questions and comments. And um, I do have one other question from uh, Vice Chair Graff. Uh, yes, George, your comment with regard to the water facility. I know that that came up during the safety element as an issue during the safety element review. And we, uh, as the planning commission, continued to follow up on that. And we received um, a letter from Carla Dillon, an email, a copy of an email on an update for that. And um, Ryan, are you are you familiar with that update that she provided on that? I don't know, I know. about that specific Did, one. Sherry, didn't you send it out? Uh, if if um, maybe George, if you could uh, get in touch with you, Sherry, you could email him a copy of that. Certainly, we'd be happy to co copy okay. George on that. Yeah, because we we got a copy of that, George, and I think that answers all of your concerns and the issues that you brought up during the safety element uh, as far as uh, emergency and so on and so forth. So uh, okay. if you could get in touch, get in touch with Sherry, she'd be, she said she'd be happy to send you a copy of it, okay? Okay, That's thank you very much. You bet. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else before we move on? Again, thank you very much, Ryan. Awesome presentation. I um, wish you any all other, luck going any, forward. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish you luck going forward. <laughs> any other any other comments from any other comments from either Tell Sherry my or, wife. or or Lemus <laughs> before Ryan leaves on that particular report? If not, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on. So we are at uh, public hearings. Item number five is the alley vacation. 
um, and I believe without going through uh, the, the paragraph, it's a request to vacate approximately 2,850 square feet of the public alley located south uh, to the property at 4516 Narbon Avenue. The request would formally convert a portion of the alley into a public accessible paseo. Uh, summary uh, vacation is categorically exempt from CEQA. And I will note that it's been continued from the April 11th meeting and the May 9th meeting. And as I understand it, there is a recommendation to continue to the July 11th meeting. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so we will continue item number five to July 11th. And so with that, I would like to entertain a motion in a second to, uh, to that. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that uh, item number five the alley vacation be continued uh, uh, to our August uh, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. I'll second okay. that. That just to clarify that, uh, Commissioner Thompson, that would be the July 11th, 2022 meeting. I'm sorry. Yes, the July. That's it. August. Okay. July. Yes. Okay. July 11th. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's uh, do roll call, Madam. Uh, I guess. What am I going to call? Is that Ma Madam City Clerk? City Clerk. <laughs> Madam no City Clerk. I know. I'm, I'm, City I'm, Clerk. Look, I'm looking at Sherry, but she's in the other side. Madam uh, Deputy City Clerk, could you please call roll? For Commissioner Dever? Yes. Commissioner Santos? Yes. Commissioner Steinbach? You're on mute. Commissioner Steinbach? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Stevens? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Vice Chair Graff? Yes. And Chair Camarada? Yes. Motion passes. Yeah, I got to get used to the fact that we're still split screen, if you would. Okay. Uh, item number six, uh, conditional use permit number 319 and site plan review number 1213 a request for a conditional use permit to allow for land uses listed in uh, the municipal code section 11-1.58.04 subparagraph a site plan review for three-story mixed use building consisting of 1198 square feet of commercial space and 11 apartments located at 24830 through 24 8388 Narbonne Avenue in the commercial corridor slash mixed unit overlay, which is the CGMUO, um, and that the uh, project is confirmed to be category exempt. Um, I do believe that we uh, also have a request to continue this to the July 11th, 2022 meeting as well. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair. We'd like you to open the public hearing and then at the appropriate time take a motion to continue it to July. And we do apologize. There was an error that we found in the staff report. And because this is your first state density uh, bonus project, we want to make sure that it is correct, obviously. So the applicant was contacted and he agreed to the continuance to July. Okay. So if we uh, go to the uh, public hearing, uh, Madam Clerk, did you receive any written communications on this item? No written communications, but I see George Kivett would like to speak. Okay. Uh, my next question was, are there any requests to speak on this item? And the answer is yes, Mr. Kivett. Um, yes, um, I, I, I'm familiar with the site. Uh, the only thing I, that I might request, and I'm not sure if this is possible to do, is uh, there's a mention of how many square feet for the commercial space, but uh, there's supposed to be a certain ratio of commercial versus residential space within the mixed use developments. So I think it would be appropriate of mentioning how many square feet total for the residential units uh, that might be within the, um, uh, the development. Um, and that, that's basically it. If they're also, I think if um, they're coming forward and they're asking for you know, some type of density bonuses, what have you, I think there it'd be good within the, the notice uh, the, of the agenda uh, just to mention that they're asking for these other additional density bonuses and such, just so that anybody that likes to follow what's happening within our city might be aware that there are some of these type of issues that are, um, uh, you know, might be presented. And that, that's basically it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kivett. Uh, let me ask uh, Commissioner, is Laura, is our make a presentation? Uh, I am yeah. here. Would you like to respond to Mr. Kivett? 
I'm going through the staff report as you know, it's very lengthy and I will fact check to make sure that if the total square footage is not contained in I, of residential, it is, it should be, um, because I do have those calculations done. And um, I, with regard to the noticing, we'll confer with the clerk um, about the appropriateness of adding that to the next, or to the next agenda item. And are there any other questions I can answer? Uh, Mr. Kivett, I believe that's a pretty good answer. Are you okay with that answer? Or oh, that, that sounds fine. That's fine. Just uh, I, I think just having a little bit more information that when uh, when uh, the agenda item is received, it it just has a little bit better perspective on um, uh, okay. you know, where things are at. And that, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else on the big screen that has any comments or questions about this item? If not, I would entertain a motion in a second to uh, so move. continue. Okay, Joaquin, uh, that's your motion. I'll second. Commissioner Stevens would be a second. Okay. Uh, Madam City Clerk, if I can do a roll call, please, on that motion. Commissioner Devitt? Yes. Commissioner Santos? Yes. Commissioner Steinbach? Yes. Commissioner Stevens? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Vice Chair Graff? Yes. And Chair Camarada? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, item six will be continued to the July 11th, 2022 meeting. Okay. The uh, next item, item number seven, is zone text amendment number 2022-01 and general plan amendment number 2002-01 as follows. Uh, you want me to read this entire zone text amendment? Okay. I so can do it if you'd like. If Do you want to go ahead and do a quick summary of it or do you want me to read it? Okay. All right. So zone text amendment as follows. A, uh, an amendment to the Lamita Municipal City Code title 11 planning and zoning chapter one zoning revise the city's regulations for accessory and junior accessory dwelling units and a determination that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA. Item B, an amendment to the Lomita, Lomita Municipal Code Title 11, or actually 10I, Planning and Zoning, Chapter 1 Zoning, establishing regulations relating to urban lot splits and two unit residential developments and single family residential zones as allowed by the state of California. Item C, Senate Bill 9, and a determination that the project is categorically exempt from the CEQA Act. And item D, an amendment to the Lomita Municipal Code Title XI Planning and Zoning, Chapter 1 Zoning, amending and revising the city's regulations for Article 15-definitions, Article 30-residential zones, Article 49, uh, downtown commercial, Article 58, the mixed use overlay. Article 66, off street parking, storage, and loading. Article 70, zoning ordinance administration, and a determination that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA. The general plan amendment is an amendment to the Lomita general plan land use element to modify the allowable development intensity within the agricultural residential, low density residential, and medium density residential categories. The applicant, of course, is the city of Lomita, and we'll have a presentation by planner Sherry Rep Loadsman and assistant planner uh, Quintero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You did a very good job of reading all that. I know it was long. Thank you. <laughs> and I do appreciate the, the Planning Commission dealing with so many housing issues over the last couple of years. Uh, with the housing element update, we've certainly become more aware of the legislation that requires us to do certain updates. But we've also looked at some of the policy decisions in order to be able to support development that meets the needs of not only our current population, but also as we grow and change as a community. Um, I do want to note for the record that we did have an amendment to the staff report. I know the planning commissioners received that on Friday. We did update the website as well so that the public has access to the same information. So we are looking for you to take several actions this evening. Uh, there are two separate resolutions. One is for the general plan, 
The other is for some of the comprehensive ordinance updates, which were just read into the record. So this evening, uh, I believe we also had some written communication that was received. And I don't know if the city clerk would like to read that into the record. Uh, yes, I believe we do have a letter uh, dated June 11th, 2022, and it is addressed to the Lomita Planning Commission. And it is from a resident, Charles Titus, Titus, if I may make that adjustment. Um, and I'd like to know if we need to read this entire thing or just enter it into the... There's no, no, there's no need to read the okay. entirety of the, okay. of the letter. Yeah, I can just summarize it on behalf of the okay. record. Um, the individual sent a, a, a email correspondence asking for clarification regarding the public hearing notice, because the public hearing notice, as the commission is aware, is generally a little bit vaguer than what we find in our staff reports. So we were able to send an email response with a copy of the link for the staff report this evening. Okay. So you will be addressing any of his comments as you go through your uh, We'll report. be addressing the entire ordinance amendment, which I think does address his where comments. his concerns okay. were in terms of Perfect. wanting to have some specificity as to what we're doing. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to pass over to our assistant, Lemesis Cantero. She is going to walk you through a fairly comprehensive presentation. Um, we know that we've covered a lot of miles in this staff report, most of it related to housing, but there are some additional areas where we are amending the code in order to address other changes in state law or just observations that we've had in terms of things that need to be updated to meet more contemporary standards. So during the presentation, feel free if you have a question from the Planning Commission, um, just let us know. We're happy to stop and answer those questions or you can wait to the end either way. But I think uh, both Menaces and myself are prepared. We've studied really hard over the last weekend. And so we're ready if you are. Okay. Well, I'll let Lemus start the uh, presentation. Thank you, Sherry. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Sherry mentioned tonight we'll be presenting zone text amendment number 2022-01 and general plan amendment number 2022-01. Next slide, please. The current Lomita Municipal Code is outdated in some areas and the proposed text amendments are necessary, necessary in order to comply with numerous state laws as well as clarify some existing language and avoid some contradictions within the municipal code. Next slide, please. And to recap our housing element, um, it was approved by City Council on December 21st, 2021. It is currently under review by the California Department of Housing and Community Development. And within the housing element, update our opportunities and commi commitments to update the zoning code to comply with state law requirements as well as support a variety of housing types. Next slide, please. The proposed text amendment addresses the following housing element programs. The first being prog program number six, which is related to accessory dwelling units. Program 13, which is related to zoning revisions for special needs housing. Program 15, which supports low density. And program number 29, which um, promotes ongoing code updates. Next slide, please. So we'll start off with accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. The state law identifies two types of ADUs, the first being ADUs and the second being junior ADUs. Um, ADUs can be either attached, detached, or constructed from conversion. Um, junior ADUs, also known as JADUs, are a specific type of conversion of existing space which are contained entirely within a single family residence are limited to 500 square feet and require owner occupancy. They must also be located on lots with single family residences. Lots with multiple dwellings are not eligible for junior ADUs. Next slide, please. The city's current regulations uh, pertaining to ADUs and junior ADUs are out of compliance with the state law, which became effective January 1st, 2020. So the city is currently defaulting to the state law to review and process ADU and junior ADU applications. So the entirety of section 11-1.30.06 will need to be amended. Next slide, please. So these are some of the amendments that are required in order to comply. Um, revising the location where ADUs and JEDs are allowed 
to include multifamily properties as well as mixed use zones. The state law also eliminated minimum lot size requirements, the number of units, uh, allowing accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units on lots with single family dwellings. As I mentioned, ADUs are now law allowed on lots with multifamily residential dwelling structures. State law also removed owner occupancy requirements until December 31st, 2024. Owner occupancy is still required for junior ADUs and parking. There are now a number of exemptions which apply to parking. And I will go over those later. Next slide, please. So um, at our housing workshop during the May meeting, we went over some proposed amendments to the accessory dwelling unit and junior accessory dwelling unit section of the Lomita Municipal Code. So these are kind of the um, development standards that um, will be included. So a minimum size of 220 square feet for ADUs and junior ADUs, a maximum size of 500 square feet for junior ADUs, maximum size for ADUs of 850 square feet for studio one bedroom and 1,000 square feet for more than one bedroom. Attached ADUs are limited to 500 square feet of the existing primary dwelling unit, but at least 800 square feet. ADUs located on lots with multifamily residential dwelling structures are limited to 800 square feet, and the conversion of legally existing square footage is not subject to the size requirements. Next slide, please. And these would be the number of units. Um, lots with an existing or proposed single family residence are allowed one ADU and one junior ADU. Properties with an existing or proposed multifamily residential stru dwelling structure are allowed their 25% um, of the number of existing units to be converted from non-habitable space within the multifamily structure. So this is oftentimes a storage room, a garage, a basement, or they're allowed uh, the construction of two detached ADUs, which are limited to 800 square feet. As I mentioned, junior ADUs are not allowed on lots with multi multifamily res residential dwelling structures. And for the purposes of state AD law, a structure with two or more attached dwelling units on a single family lot is considered a multifamily dwelling structure. Multiple detached single, single unit dwellings on the same lot are not considered multifamily dwelling structures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, going into the height, um, 16 feet height maximum for ADUs with a four feet rear and side setback. And that is the state uh, minimum. And 27 feet high maximum, but they must comply with the setbacks of the underlying zone, which is 20 feet rear and five feet side. Parking, as I mentioned, um, the ADs are required one parking space, but there are exemptions in the state law. And these are the exemptions. Um, accessory dwelling units that are located within half a mile walking distance of a public transit. It's two dwelling units located in an architectural and historically significant historic district. Accessory dwelling units that are part of a proposed or existing primary residence or an accessory structure. Um, when parking permits are required but not offered to the occupant of the accessory dwelling unit. And when there is a car share vehicle located within one block of the accessory dwelling unit. State law was further revised to define transit stop as including any bus stop which provides a parking exemption to the majority of the residentially zoned properties in Lomita. Next slide, please. Um, the state law does not currently impose any design standards. So these are the sta design standards that are proposed. A replacement of the garage door shall include facade, which shall include one window or entryway. The entry door shall not open directly towards an alley. ADUs and junior ADU entrances shall include an exterior light fixture. ADUs and JADU shall have a separate main entrance. The numerical numeral shall be clearly visible from the street. ADUs and junior ADU shall match building architecture of the existing primary dwelling, such as roof pitch, roof type, ex exterior colors, and materials, and including an open space requirement. This open space requirement mirrors uh, the open space requirement for SB9 units which is 225 square feet of minimum, um, with minimum interior dimension of 10 feet. Next slide, please. 
State law does require each local jurisdiction to submit its AD ordinance to HCD within 60 days of adoption. Failure to provide the ordinance uh, may require HCD to notify the Attorney General. In regards to any incentives for the construction of accessory dwelling units, the Planning Commission is encouraged to consider the development of programs to incentivize the development of ADUs offered at, at an affordable rent. Additional incentives, incentives can be used to support for housing options such as ADUs, which are designed to comply with uh, the Americans with Disability Act. The proposed text amendment does not include any incentives and may require the following an update to the AD or ordinance as well as city council approval to reduce or waive any fees. So Lemus, just before you go on, I think it would be worthwhile just to kind of briefly discuss this with the Planning Commission. So this is one of your programs within your housing element, and it is something that the state has been encouraging cities to accomplish in order to provide for additional housing resources associated with ADUs. What we've seen with a lot of cities is that they've done primarily a reduction or a waiver of fees. So for example, um, building permit fees, if that's something that the city is paying directly with their own staff, sometimes they'll give a reduction or some type of factoring. Um, if there are development impact fees, they will have them pay a portion or waive all of them. Uh, and that would be specifically related to providing affordable housing for ADUs. Uh, we mentioned earlier when the city manager was giving the, the overview of SB9 and also in this report that for those new units that are created with SB9, we are requiring them to be affordable, but there's no other concessions. The question is for ADUs, if you want to encourage and or um, facilitate affordability, you know, is there something that you recommend to the city council as it relates to fees? The planning commission doesn't have direct responsibility or authority over fees because you don't set those resolutions. Um, but certainly if that's something that you're interested in, we can either discuss it tonight or we can put it on a future agenda and the staff can bring back more information showing how other cities are addressing those issues. Um, the other item that we wanted to bring up though is just something that we personally think is important is that often ADUs are used for multi-generational housing. So you may have a senior who is aging in place on the property, they move into the ADU. And if they're not initially constructed as being accessible, um, it's difficult sometimes to use those units. So we think it would also be a good public policy to provide an incentive for ADUs to be accessible by providing the slightly wider doorways, making sure the bathrooms and the kitchens are more accessible. Um, that's something that if you wanted to do, we could fairly easily incorporate an amendment within the ordinance this evening. Um, our suggestion would be that we do something very simple like giving them a 50 square foot bonus. You know, again, rewarding them for good behavior. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, you know, during our discussion or during the public hearing process, just let us know. There's no questions directly related to that. We'll pass it back to Lemesis. Thank you, Sharon. Um, next slide, please. Okay, moving on to urban lot splits and two unit developments related to Senate Bill 9. Next slide, please. So this is a timeline of Senate Bill 9 and the city's response to Senate Bill 9. It became effective January 1st of this year. In February to, to, on February 28th, City Council adopted urgency ordinance number 832U, and on April 5th, it was extended. There are two components to Senate Bill 9, the urban lot split and the two unit development. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, City Council adopted urgency ordinance, which is uh, temporary. It was extended for 10 months and 15 days. And in order for the ordinance to become permanent, it must go through the adoption process. Nothing is, there are no major changes to the proposed development standards from the interim standards that were contained in or, or, urgency ordinance number 832U. Next slide, please. And these are the proposed development standards, a maximum unit size of 800 square feet, 16 feet height maximum, open space requirement of 225 square feet, um, the affordability requirement that second units or both units of a two unit development shall be rented at an affordable rent for lower income for a minimum of 30 years. 
Uh, next slide, please. One parking space is required for every new unit created, but there are exempt exemptions under Senate Bill 9. Lots that are located within half a mile walking distance of either a high quality transit corridor or a major transit stop. These are different than the uh, parking exemptions for ADUs. They're a lot stricter. So a major, a high quality transit stop or a major transit stop is defined as a fixed route bus service with service intervals no longer than 15 minutes during peak commute hours. So mainly properties along Western or PCH would be the ones that would be located within um, half a mile of a walking distance of high quality transit stop. There is also a maximum walk coverage of 50%, a prohibition on short-term rentals, and the plan should also identify the location of mature trees on site and provide measures to ensure the preservation of these trees. Next slide, please. So these are some miscellaneous amendments to Title 11, the Planning and Zoning Code, which are necessary to create consistency throughout the zoning code and as well as avoid any, any conflicts with the other amendments that we're discussing tonight. Next slide, please. So starting off with definitions, next slide, please. These are some definitions that will be included in Article 15, and the majority of these definitions are related to ADUs and junior ADUs in Senate Bill 9. The reasonable accommodation definitions um, were already approved by Planning Commission and City Council. They just never made their way into the zoning code, so we're just kind of wrapping that up. Next slide, please. So moving on to some proposed amendments to residential zones. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, a lot of these amendments are just to clarify and avoid any conflicts throughout the zoning code. We'll be amending the development chart and residential uses to allow for um, the uses that will be allowed under SB9, as well as ADU, junior ADUs, of revising the location of utility and mechanical equipment to create some standards, and then also allowing carports persuading to a modification in a site plan review. Next slide, please. Um, also proposed is including hedges under the requirements for fences and walls, uh, clarifying secondary front yards, and introducing some materials for fences and walls, as well as some prohibited materials. Establishing and clarifying some language related to state licensed community care facilities and large family child care facilities. And also um, amending senior housing section of the code to include minimum unit sizes, which will comply with state law. Next slide, please. Also proposed tonight is including planned residential developments into the residential zone. Next slide, please. This will incentivize new subdivisions and support detached single family development by increasing the density to one unit per 4,000 square feet of lot area. These new development, developments will redevelop properties and create new options for those entering the housing market by increasing opportunity for fee simple type of ownership. This will include identifying objective design standards for properties in A1 and R1 zones, which can be subdivided to accommodate additional single family units. The proposed text amendment establishes design and development standards for an administrative site plan review for planned or residential developments. So this would be an administrative approval and would only go up to planning commission if there's subdivision involved. Next slide, please. Each, pro each project would be required to provide single family homes with shared facilities, such as drive aisles, trash areas, and common recreation space, which would be reserved and maintained by a homeowners association. As I mentioned, the Planning Commission would review and approve the subdivision to establish the plan planned residential development. Next slide, please. Related to the planned residential development is the general plan amendment, which would amend the current land categories for architectural, our, our agricultural residential and low density residential to create a density of up to 8.7 units. 
from 8.7 units to allow a higher density to 10, of 10.89 units, which would be equivalent to one unit per 4,000 4, square feet. The me medium density land use category requires adjustment to correspond to the changes in the land use category for agricultural, residential, and low density res residential. Next slide, please. And this is simply just showing the revisions to the development standards chart and showing that increased density. Next slide, please. And this would be um, the amendment to create multiple single family dwellings. And this would establish regulations for additional single family dwellings, which are not ADUs or SB9 units. Eligible lots would be A1 and R1 zones with a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet. The density of the partial shall not exceed 5,000 square feet per unit. In regards to de the development standards, they shall comply with all standards applicable to single family dwellings, such as setbacks, height, floor area ratio. These types of units would be required to provide guest parking at one space per every two units. Next slide, please. Moving on to Article 66, off-street parking, storage, and loading. Next slide, please. So this would introduce regulations for shared and reduced parking in commercial zones. This is something that the city has done in the past through including conditions of, of approval on entitlement projects such as site plan reviews and conditional use permits, but there has been no um, established procedures or required findings or requirements for these types of um, applications or requests. Um, so this would include uh, regulations for shared and reduced parking. Uh, there would be three types of different, three types of shared and reduced parking provisions, a reduction in the number of off street parking spaces required, a shared provision for parking serving more than one use, an offsite prov provision of parking or a combination of all three. The addition of these provisions would introduce flexibility required to attract new businesses to the city, as well as allow existing business, existing Lumita businesses to grow without the restraint of off street parking requirements. Next slide, please. This would require an amendment to the Lumita Municipal Code to introduce the requirement of a minor conditional use permit. Um, the findings in the process of a minor conditional use permit are identical to those of a conditional use permit, the only difference being a lower application fee. Next slide, please. In considering a minor conditional use permit for these types of parking reductions, the Planning Commission would consider a clear and convincing evidence that the parking demand is less than the required parking per Lumina Municipal Code, uh, review a parking demand study submitted by the applicant, review any evidence that there a reduction of parking would not affect uh, nearby properties, as well as review the traffic circulation on site. And some examples of conditions of approval would be a guarantee that there would be no substantial alteration in the uses, which would create a greater demand for parking, written agreement between all parties, as well as any rem remedies in the event of a change of use. Next slide, please. And these are just some uh, minor amendments to Article 66, which would just clean up the zoning code as well as avoid any conflict. Um, introducing location and dimensions for compact parking spaces. Introduce the location and dimensions for motorcycle parking spaces. Revising the fractional space requirement when calculating parking spaces required. Requiring bicycle parking as well as parking spaces for fuel efficient vehicles and electrical vehicle charging equipment that's required by the California Green Building Standards Code, introducing standards for dri driveway pavement, as well as just clarifying any language to include parking requirements for ADUs, SB9 units. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the proposed amendments provide greater opportunities for development by establishing development standards that promote a wide range of housing types. Um, so these are just some of the, the relationship between the proposed amendment and the general plan. Complies with the housing element policy number 
which supports programs and incentives that expand housing options, especially for lower income households and those experiencing homelessness, promote um, and encourage innovation and creativity in housing development through regulations that increase transparency and flexibility in the development approval process. Land use policy number nine, which states that the city will work to protect and promote property values by promoting um, a more efficient use of underutilized properties and structures consistent with the city's economic development. Next slide, please. And land use policy number 13, the city would work with, to manage growth and development in the city consistent with historic trends within the city. A circulation policy, the city would evaluate parking restrictions as well as any regulations to increase the availability of parking whenever possible without jeopardizing safety. Economic development policy number three, the city will promote the improvement and revitalization of existing commercial areas and neighborhood shopping centers. Next slide, please. Staff recommends the following, adopting a resolution recommending the approval to the City Council of Zone Text Amendment number 2022-1, modifying regulations for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units, establishing permanent regulations for urban lot splits and two-unit developments, establishing development standards for planned residential developments and multiple single-family dwellings, establishing provisions for shared and reduced parking and commercial zones and various text amendments for code cleanup and clarification. Adopt a resolution recommending approval to the City Council of uh, General Plan Amendment number 2022-1, amending the City of Lumina General Plan, land use development standards to modify the density for agricultural, residential, low density, residential, and medium residential land use designation. Next slide, please. The, projects, the project is exempt from CEQA, pursuing so section 15061 subsection B3. The proposed text amendment general plan amendment will not have a significant effect on the environment because the proposed amendments would provide for new standards because it's consistent with sea law and do not propose any physical construction. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chair. Okay, Levis, thank you for your presentation. Um, we will go to uh, questions from commissioners. Uh, Vice Chair Graf, any questions? Not at this time. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Dever, any questions? <clears throat> Not at this time. Okay. Commissioner Santos on the big screen. Questions? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Steinbach on the big screen. Any questions? No, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Stevens. Any questions? Not at this time. Okay. And Commissioner Thompson on the big screen. Any questions? Uh, no questions, just a comment. I, I'd like to thank the staff uh, for the very careful wording. I did study this in great detail. In, in accordance with our previous meetings and discussions about SB9 and the uh, proposed um, changes to our municipal law, which this is. I think the staff did a really good job of uh, addressing a lot of concerns that we, we had. And also, I, I, I don't see anything that's gonna run afoul of the state law on this while, while doing the, the most that we can as a city um, to control what we can of the development of, under SB9 of the ADUs and the junior ADUs. So that's just my general comment. I think the staff did a really good job of, of carefully analyzing the SB9 and coming up with these proposed uh, uh, zone text amendments, amendments to the uh, general plan. I want to thank them. That's very carefully considered and a lot of work went into that, I'm, I'm sure. So thank you very much for that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, I have two quick comments. Number one is I believe when I read the initial uh, uh, amendment item number seven, it said zone text amendment number 22-01 and general plan amendment 200201. Should that be 2022-1? Oh, I want to make sure I have that in my head. Okay, so that's done. And then the only other comment I had on uh, section 11-1.3007 about fences, I believe um, the recommendation was fences and walls should be built with attractive durable materials including but not limited to redwood 
wrought iron textured concrete block or formed concrete with reveals, chain link fencing, corrugated metal fencing, and or fiberglass fencing and tennis windscreens are not permitted within the front yard. My comment was vinyl fencing is an alternative. It's the, you know, the, the, the kind of the run of the mill now with vinyl fencing out doing wood fencing. So I just want to make sure that vinyl fencing could be included in that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think that's actually a good observation. Um, I know for myself, I bought vinyl for a recent gate. So it is something that is a more, um, durable. I guess, contemporary and durable yeah. material other than using wood. So I think when there is a motion on the floor, it would be appropriate just to instruct staff to make that inclusion of vinyl materials being acceptable. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair, maybe before we go on, can I make a few comments? Absolutely. Okay, because this has been a very, um, very lengthy analysis to try to come up with all these ordinance amendments. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make it clear that while many of them are directly associated with state laws where we needed to make some updates, mm -hmm. some of them are obviously a little bit more subjective based on the experience of staff and talking with the commission and various community members, mm -hmm. just things that need to be updated to be, again, more contemporary. I think the fences are a very good example of that. Um, Lamita still had on its books the ability for people to use chain link fence within the front yards. And if you go through many communities, that has not been allowed for many years in many communities. So I encourage both the Planning Commission and those within the city to continue to reflect on what the community really wants as it continues to grow and change. Um, because ordinance amendments are important to be able to communicate effectively, not only to the decision makers, but really to the community as a whole. Because if we don't say what we want, people can't read our minds. Right? So having clear and concise ordinances are appropriate for that. Um, just a couple of points in terms of some of the things that are included within this ordinance amendment. As it relates to shared parking, that is also a technique that is very common in most jurisdictions. They recognize that both as an economic development tool, but also as just a way to be kinder to our environment. Uh, having huge paved parking lots is not always appropriate. So being able to look on a case by case basis for those locations and those land uses that can reasonably share parking can be a really good beneficial thing for a community, individual property owners and businesses. So that's why we've inserted this proposed amendment to allow for shared parking. Um, we have asked that we use a minor condition use permit process because frankly going through a CUP is expensive. Um, and most of the time these are fairly straightforward review processes. So using the minor CUP, I think it's closer to $1,500 versus thousands and thousands for a main CUP. Mm -hmm. um, I would also encourage the commission to look at the minor CUP as being a type of application that we can use on additional types of requests. Um, because if we're always using a conditional use permit, that can be very scary and very costly. So there may be other things that you identify in the future that a minor CUP, you now have it on your books, you can use it. Right? Um, just quickly as it relates to the child care facilities, um, your code was just out of date. The state had updated it so that more children could be accommodated within residential settings. So we've increased the numbers so that we're consistent with the state. But what we've also done is we've suggested development standards so that residents who are conducting this type of business activity, they know one, get a business license, although I will tell you that most do not have a business license, but we'll, we'll try to remind them of that. Um, and secondly, that they do things to be good neighbors. Um, in terms of having the strong fences, walls, or other separations where children are pay playing, making sure that there's drop-off areas so that it's safe in terms of the use of the street, making sure there's enough parking so that you're not just forcing everything onto the street. But I know the commissions had looked at those standards, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, we're trying to right-size the ordinance so that not only it meets state laws, but it's also being protective of the neighborhoods as well. Uh, one other thing I did want to say on the shared parking is that we do have at least one, if not two, applications that we expect to be submitted as soon as this ordinance comes into play. Um, sometimes developers find that they get caught short um, and they, they need to make accommodations to try to accomplish all of their goals. This shared parking helps them to do that, but still being protected. So don't be surprised in the next couple of months if you don't have a, C a minor CUP coming before you. Uh, and then just going back to the residential, because that's kind of been, you know, the, the main discussion that we've been having associated with this ordinance. Um, and this is also for the community's benefit, because if those who are participating in this public hearing remotely or even in the audience, 
um, may not have heard a lot of our past conversations. So the purpose of the ordinance amendments that you have before you this evening is we'll create a tiered approach on how we develop our single family neighborhoods, which is both the agricultural zones as well as the R1 zone. With the ADUs, um, many of the requirements are specified by the state law, but as indicated by Lemesis, we have some local control over certain features. So we are trying to tighten up the standards that would otherwise be applied by the state. So there is a, a real net benefit for us to have our own local ordinance. It helps make sure that we don't overbuild on very small properties. Um, and I think by encouraging people to have the better setbacks, they're then rewarded by the ability to have a second story if they so choose with an ADU. It's just one example of, of what we've accomplished with this ordinance. The SB9, um, I think while many of us were very, uh, very concerned and maybe afraid of SB9 and what it might do to our communities, I think in reality, because of some of the local measures that we've incorporated, I don't really expect to see very many SB9 proposals coming forward. Now on the flip side, one of the, the main goals that we've seen in the housing element process is how do we actually provide for appropriate and balanced development within the single family areas for those properties that are oversized. It's not uncommon in Lamita to have properties that are 10, 15, 20,000 square feet in size. Um, right now with the ADU and the SB9 ordinances, there's not a lot of opportunity. I mean, they have very small units, they may have an affordability requirement. It really doesn't allow an optimization of that development scenario. So you have two proposals within the current ordinance amendment. One is for the multifamily, I'm sorry, for the multiple single family dwellings. And this is really intended for someone who has an oversized lot, maybe they have one house and they're trying to build on the back of the property, but they don't wanna just provide an 800 square foot development. If they're able to meet, meet the same standards that would other, otherwise apply to a house, they would be eligible, eligible to be able to build on a one to 5,000 square foot density, just like any other single family house. It's a 5,000 square foot average that we would find for this house. And just like with other single family, we're proposing that that just be an administrative process. If they can demonstrate they can meet the requirements, they can get their permits. Can't make it much easier than that. Now, the other component is the planned residential development. And this really is meant to be an incentive for property owners who have oversized to completely redevelop. And we know that some of these oversized properties, they were agricultural. Some of them still have a few barns left on them, right? Um, and I wouldn't see that being converted to a house easily. So knowing that there's likely going to be a demolition of all structures and starting over, the planned residential development provides for a density of one to 4,000. So one house for every 4,000 square feet. But the development standards that we've incorporated really encourage some best practices, uh, making sure that there is consolidation where appropriate, for example, on driveways. Let's just have one driveway serving all of the houses, um, that there is some common use of open space so that there's true recreational space, and maybe also encouraging cluster housing so it's more of a, a little village that gets created. I think ultimately that creates real value within our neighborhood. So it's not just a house facing a street with a garage facing the street, but it's the ability to be able to have interaction between these new homeowners. And the most important part of that is that we're really in increasing the opportunity for home ownership. The commission has heard me talk about this many times over the last couple of years, that Lamita has become more and more of a rental community. Part of that is because of our housing stock, but part of it is just that investors like Lamita they're buying up our houses and they're renting them back out. It's my hope that the planned residential development will truly provide opportunities for new home ownership. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to craft these ordinances. It may not be 100% perfect, but we think we've done a pretty darn good job. Um, I'd specifically like to thank Lemesis for a lot of her work in this effort. Um, she's been very, very steady and, and Caught some of my mistakes, which I do, do appreciate, other than my one on Friday, which she wasn't here for. Um, but we are happy to answer any further questions from the commission. And I know we have a public hearing. There's at least one person in the audience. I don't know if we have anybody on Zoom. But we're certainly happy to address anything that you'd like to discuss. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. And again, thank you, Lemesis, for your report. Uh, at this point, I would uh, like to open up the public hearing. Uh, Madam Clerk, did you receive any written communications on this item? Just the one item that was mentioned earlier. Right, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and with that, 
being said, uh, I want to defer back to Sherry. Do you think that everything that Lemus has presented, I'll, I can ask Lemus this as well, do you think it addresses the uh, letter received by Mr. Uh, Charles Titus? Or does it not answer it? Or does it answer part of him? At least we know that he's, his questions have been answered to some degree. So Mr. Chair, question. I think we've provided substantial detail okay. this evening, and also it is a public hearing, so Mr. Titus was aware that he could participate, so I don't know if he's on the Zoom call or not, but he has any further questions, okay. we're happy so, to follow So for the record, I just want to make sure we're addressing his letter, that's all. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a question on that. Has council reviewed this letter, and do they concur with the finding, the items that are set forth in here? As in, do I agree with the contents of the letter, or do I, do I agree with the, with her response? Because I definitely agree with with, with her response, um, and that yes, I, I I have seen that letter. Okay, and, so and, and you you believe that what has been presented answers all of answers the, all of the questions that because they brought up legal issues in here. Correct. All and of I just want to yeah. make sure that that council agrees that we've covered the issues here. I agree. Okay, thank you. And to clarify, that's legal council, not city council. Just to make sure we're on the same page, Mike. <laughs> okay, with that being said, uh, I do believe we have one hand up with Mr. Kivett and we have one gentleman in the uh, audience. So if there is any request to speak on this item, uh, we can start with either the gentleman in the audience or Mr. Kivett. Okay, so. Okay, so Mr. Kivett, I believe you have, re you have your hand up, so go ahead. Yeah, well, I've mentioned this uh, probably a hundred times to the Planning Commission and the City Council. As much as possible, I like to maintain our present densities within our R1 and A1 areas. And I know there's these uh, regulations coming down from the state, oh. but um, I know we're kind of stuck in that sense, but over time, things shift. And I, I just hate to see Lomita just kowtowing to you know, uh, you know, some higher power uh, that we got to do this or we got to do that. There's reasons why I moved to Lamita. Uh, I've been in my house for 38 years now, in a couple of months, 38 years. And I, I love the density. I love the agricultural areas, which I'm four or five houses away from uh, within uh, where I live here. And I just hate to see uh, the Lamita, the texture of Lamita change dramatically. That, like I said, there's reasons why I moved here. There's reasons why many others moved here. Um, I'm very much against this um, urban lot splits. I mean, I, I got uh, you know five you know under six thousand foot lot. I couldn't even imagine splitting my lot and then on each side of that having uh, a couple new residential units built. It'd just be crazy. There's not even the infrastructure to support it. Um, and I, I'm very much against that. And I do like new development in a general sense. Uh, because at least I did in the past, because when you did new development, then you would bring things into the current parking standards, which until very recently would provide for more parking in a general sense, especially in our commercial zones, which are very much under parked. But uh, to re reduce the parking requirements, uh, there's many streets within our city, uh, Oak Street, Cypress Street. I mean, I could go on and on, Pennsylvania, where you have virtually no available parking spaces. Um, and other than, you know, uh, once they're full in the afternoon, that's it. And people are circling the neighborhood and to reduce parking requirements is crazy. Um, but um, we're kind of stuck where we are now, but uh, I've expressed this view in the past and uh, I'm gonna stick to my points on this that I do not wanna see as a general rule our densities uh, greatly increased within our residential and agricultural zones. Uh, and th there was the one comment about vinyl fencing, and I think that'd be fine to throw in. Uh, it's very, very applicable um, building material now, but um, uh, th those are my views on uh, this item. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a I have a couple of questions. 
Um, on the, the, is this the draft ordinance that you let, gave for us tonight? That is one of three exhibits to the resolution. So the first ordinance is dealing with ADUs and JADUs. The second is dealing with SB9. The third, which we gave you the updated version, that's the one that's the miscellaneous that includes the uh, planned residential development, the multiple single family dwellings, and the myriad of little changes that Lemesis read into. That's the one, that's the one I'm talking about. Yep. I, D? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right. I think it's actually referred to as C1 in your staff report. Yeah, your your agenda shows D. I think they, somehow it got a, um, one of the sentences got separated. So the C yeah, became a separated. D. Yeah. C. But it really is C1 as your exhibit. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, on the, on the draft ordinance here, um, I've noticed um, several places throughout here, uh, you talk about amending the municipal code title 11. That title 11, should that be Title one one or Title X one X. Roman numeral or Roman regular? numeral Roman numeral. Yep. So you want you might want to check because section is I know regular eleven. Right. Title is Roman numeral, and you go through this because there's numerous places that that occurs. We're going to hire you as our spell checker. <laughs> and, and I would just comment. That's why I you you and to uh, Commissioner Stevens as well. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So, and yeah, there's another place that's just X little I. I saw also. that too. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, we, we will fix that. And just so that you know, we actually have a company that we use to implement our municipal code into the website and to do it electronically. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they go through and they check for all those little things. Right. So it's rare that they miss them, but they might. Yeah, but, but our time, spell check. Sometimes you do searches, you know. Yeah, our spell check doesn't catch it. That happens. <laughs> yeah, um, on uh, page 11 of the same document at the top, um, uh, item three, the second, uh, third line per square feet expect, and should I think be accept? Yes, thank you. Um, I know it's knit, but I mean, that's okay. How are we certain appreciate things pop, certain things pop out at you. Um, on channel, uh, channel, <laughs> channel 18, <laughs> page 18, I noticed that under uh, paragraph C, the very last line, a city business license shall be obtained has been stricken. Does that mean that uh, family day daycare homes do not any longer need a business license? No, not at all. In fact, if you go further down, you'll see that there's a new paragraph C, which is a general requirement. Yes. So this section has been broken up to um, to address two separate issues. One would be community care facilities and also the daycare facilities. So the paragraph C are the general requirements that apply to both. It covers all. So okay. yeah, so they're okay. all Thank required you. to get a business license. Thank right? you very much. Um, <laughs> this came into a discussion earlier, but I I just got I. I'm trying to understand uh, page 23, graph four, reduction in parking requirements. The planning commission may approve a reduction in parking spaces pursuant to uh, the following. And it talks, now it says the planning commission may approve it. It doesn't say they have to approve it, right? Uh, and I'm just trying to understand are in compliance with those government codes that are listed in subparagraph A. Um, it says parking requirements for a density bonus project upon the written request of a developer. Does that mean it, that the commission may approve it based on a written request by a developer or they have to, or they have to approve it based on a written request by a developer that's actually a very good question because as it relates to the state law sometimes you you have limited and in some cases maybe no discretion um, under the state density bonus law and you had one project that you were tentatively going to be reviewing earlier we were trying to explain that there are concessions and reductions depending on what is being requested and what the developer believes is necessary to be able to support the project Parking is one of the main ones that is subject to a reduction. 
in some cases under the state density bonus law, um, it is prescriptive. They automatically get certain reductions. They are right on screen. Automatically eligible automatically. and they receive reductions. So it's not discretionary at all. In other cases, the applicant may ask for further reductions, which will most likely go through the state density bonus process, which means that it's really not subject to discretion of the Planning Commission. Uh, but we tell you that here just so that you're aware that these types of reductions are not always just through the minor CUP process. They may also be through this other process. Where is it, where is it specified what has to be accepted if a, if a developer requests it? Well, I will let Pat give a brief overview of that first. Sure. So, you know, the... I know it's not a very satisfying answer, but I think kind of the, the answer to your question is it really depends on the project. And so, but to answer your question, it, th that would likely be in the state density bonus law in the, in the government code. So that would, that would kind of list, there's a very, very dense section that lists all of the pertinent percentages. So if you have basically, if you have a very low income versus low income, and then there's various different um, incentives that you get based on that percentage. Okay, so, excuse me. So that means if you have a one very low income unit, it holds true for the entire facility? For that entire project, yes. Yes, and, and, and I apologize. And then it also, once again, depends on what the applicant, aka developer, asks. While well, she was very accurate that most of the time it is parking, sometimes it's not. Sometimes they want a few more feet in height, sometimes they want lesser setbacks. And so that's why it's, you know, you know, I don't want to echo a, a sentiment that was issued by, by chair. It, it's hard to craft an ordinance that's kind of this one size fits all for, you know, even though we can project and say, hey, this is most likely what's going to come down, you know, through the application, we kind of have to draft it this way to ensure that there is some flexibility. So the these, code. these government, these government codes that are specified here, specifically, um, set forth requirements that a developer can demand of a city. That's accurate, sir. Yes. So Commissioner, Commissioner Graf, I think when we have the public hearing next month and we're, we have a project specific, yes. uh, we'll be able to get into more detail in terms of how the state density bonus law works. But I think the, um, the summary that we provided is that there are a menu of choices that a developer can choose from, some in which we have no say so at all, many of which the, the developer, if they can demonstrate that it is what they need for the project to be successful, we really don't have a say so. But as with most relationships, often developers will work with communities because they understand it's a win-win. You know, they want to make sure that the project is successful. Some developers. Some of them. So, but for the most part, that has been our experience so far. So, so Mark, we will have so, more discussion in July. Yeah, I, I know, and I know I'm getting into minutia here, but it still plays a part right here. <clears throat> in that particular uh, project that's going to come back, come next month that we're going to discuss, the presentation lays out the Lameda Code requirements for parking and sets forth, and then it also shows what is being requested or what the project asks. Right, so to clarify, Mike, we'll have a real life scenario. No, 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 I know, I, I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just trying to understand basically if they request, make a request for parking or whatever, height or whatever, under these laws, if they have low income housing, you know, in many, many cases, the city has nothing to say about. That is correct. Thank you. So basically what we're saying, when each project comes before us, we see the ordinances and how they apply to each one, depending on the project, what, what can or cannot be done. So it's kind of a living ordinances where they they can change per project that um, with the state density bonus law it's it's more how we apply them it's almost like a recipe we know we have certain ingredients 
what are the ingredients that the developer is choosing in order to make their project, right? And they have, there, there's, there's choices for them to make. And often they're doing it in a way to make sure that the project is financially feasible and that it's meeting the ultimate goal in terms of the number of residential units, the number of affordable units. But as I indicated, what happens with most communities is that your city staff sit down with the developer and they really try to have a good dialogue so that the choices that the developer makes hopefully is beneficial for the community as well. And sometimes it may feel that you know, you're just getting, getting pushed into a situation, right? And that is true with state density bonus law. It's meant to be that way. But in most cases, again, you can generally still end up with a project that is mutually beneficial. Okay, so the next uh, commissioner, Commissioner Dever, was that your question and comment? Okay, all right. Uh, Commissioner Santos on the big screen. Comments, questions? Yeah, only one one question. In the presentation, there was a discussion about uh, fees and if we wanted uh, to bring it up at a later meeting uh, with support of that of other cities as to what they use or what they charge. And I just wanna make sure that we we do move it forward to another meeting. That's all. So noted. Uh, Commissioner Steinbach, comments, questions on the big screen? Not at this time, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stevens, comments or questions? Yeah, I have um, a couple comments and a question. But page two also has a typo um, in the very first sentence, shall man a junior accessory dealer? But <clears throat> sorry, Mike, I didn't even take the spotlight. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second thing is, is, is Everybody knows my position on parking and we all feel the same way. If you live a, in a residential area, um, there's way too many cars for the amount of parking spaces. And it seems that driveways are now turning into places where people park their motor homes and then they park three or four cars on a street that's already overcrowded. So when, when they're adding these additional homes or splitting these lots, in the, the R1 and the A1 section. I'm really concerned that they need, they, there needs to be some kind of specific number of parking spaces or for, for a house where they're not off street parking. There, there needs to be, and I don't know if we can do that. I don't know where it falls under this, but but I think there needs to be a specific section dealing with R1, A1 lot splits or urban splits or whatever they are, where it's mandatory that they have at least two parking spots, which still isn't enough, but at least two to, to accommodate, because we all have more than one car. I mean, like, you know, I don't know anybody that only has one car. Um, and I park them in my driveway. But if I want to put my motorhome in my driveway, then I move my cars out to the street, which takes up two spots on a street that doesn't have any spots. So that's one concern that I have. Um, and then the second one is just kind of off the wall is section 11, 8 on page 16, household and farm. Am I reading this right? Household pets are permitted in residential zones provided that the number does not exceed three dogs or cats over the age of six months. I'm sorry, I, I, I read this thing from front to back and I, I was just flabbergasted by that. That is an existing code requirement and we are not proposing any amendments to it. And we don't enforce it. Um, the city has done periodic enforcements primarily when there's complaints. But generally, unless somebody brings it to our attention and there is an issue, we're not going to know that there's that many animals being kept on a property. Right. But I think it is a good point, though, that you know, for ordinances that have meaning and that you want to be enforced, residents need to know about them. So sometimes using your newsletter or using other social media to be able to remind people that they shouldn't have these things, including like roosters, which I know sometimes becomes a problem. <laughs> Well, yeah. you know, and I appreciate, I appreciate that. However, when you're living in a community and it's a community that's guided by rules, the rules are intended for a purpose. 
And that's why we have a planning commission and a city council to develop community standards that not only meet the requirements of the state, but really meet the requirements of the community. Um, so I think your point's well taken, but that, that section has been there, gosh, well, I'm guessing for- I mean, I've been in the city for 60 plus years and I've never heard that before. So yeah. I, was, I just thought it was kind of, it was just more of a common thing. Okay. And then I just want to follow up that that section is not unique in that for the most part, we are a complaint driven code enforcement. Of course, if something is yeah. visible clearly right. from the public right away, we're not going to ignore it. But for the most part, there is a plethora of various, you know, things that we would have the city, when I say we, the city would have no idea about absent a complaint. This, like those, is, is, is one of them. We do not have code enforcement officers peeking around trying to count up dogs. Yeah. That's right, knocking on every door. Kind of like <laughs> yeah, and you know, and just for your information, when you're reading the code, if you ever want to have an idea of when the last update occurred, if you look at the end of that section, you'll find an area that's in parentheses, and it talks about the ordinance number, and it'll also include a date. That's the last time that ordinance was updated. So in this case, for animals, it was in 2009. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make one other comment to your, your earlier observation as it relates to parking. So in the ordinances that are before you this evening, we've been very clear as it relates to the, the exceptions that are allowed for parking for ADUs and SB9. The code has exempted out many, many properties within the city because of their location next to transit. Um, for ADUs, there's also requirements or provisions. I think it's ADUs for like the carpools and other types of things. But when, when it's all said and done, we can't require more parking when the state has already occupied that space. They've told us we can't do it. But what we can do is with the multiple single family dwellings and the planned residential development, we can absolutely require parking there. So that kind of that reward system, you provide parking, you get a bigger house. Okay, uh, Commissioner Thompson on the big screen questions. No questions, thank you. Okay, I think at this point we um, have closed the public hearing. We've had the uh, last round of comments and questions. So if there are no more questions or discussion items, uh, I'd like to ask for a motion and a second on, on, uh, on this. And my question before we do that, is this gonna be in one, motion to adopt both the uh, ZTA and the general plan amendment? Yes. Okay. So with that being said, is there a motion and a second to adopt the uh, own text amendment number 2022-1 and general plan amendment number 22? So moved. -1. Okay, so moved by Joaquin Santos. So motion by Santos, second. I'll second it. Okay. I uh, believe Commissioner Thompson was muted, but I do look like you're trying to make the second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Unmute yourself. So there's a motion by Commissioner Santos and a second by Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, point of clarification. I believe in the discussion, I thought I heard the majority of commissioners being favorable to a minor amendment, which would include vinyl. I, I was vinyl, about yes. to say. Okay. Well, I was sure. about to say, with a motion and a second, I want to make sure that that motion second does include the term vinyl fencing on uh, page 16, which would be in section 11.1-30.07. Uh, Commissioner Santos and Thompson, you agree with that? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And unless there's any other changes, then I think we can go ahead and do a roll call. So, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please do a roll call? Commissioner Dever? Yes. Commissioner Santos? Yes. Commissioner Steinbach? Yes. Commissioner Stevens? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Vice Chair Graff? Yes. And Chair Camarada? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so that does pass unanimously. Okay, we are done with that. We are going to move on to scheduled items. Item number eight, communication regarding city council actions. Um, I don't know who's doing that. Um, I'm not sure we have much to add because I think the city manager probably provided really very good detail at the beginning of the meeting. I just wanted to remind the planning commission and the audience that we have Founders Day coming up. So in case one of you was not going to announce that, I will. 
Um, but I also want to let you know that we will have at least one display board available during Founders Day that will talk about upcoming projects, some of which you, some of you don't know about. So you might want to pay attention to that when you go to Founders Day. Okay. Well, thank you. And I, and I... Well, what I'm saying is that we have some surprises for you. <laughs> it's your birthday, Mike. Right. We're, yeah, we're going to have just one display board. It's not going to be overly elaborate, but it is going to talk about some of the projects that we ex either expect applications or already have applications pending, but this commission doesn't know about them yet. So you might want to take a look so you have kind of a preview of things to come. No, no Mike, that's a surprise. Come to the event. <laughs> We'll take a picture and send you'll, you'll it to you. Here, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a few of us that are on the commission that are also on the CERC, uh, subcommittee that will be manning a booth that day. So you can't have any excuses not to walk over to the city. Okay, anything else? Sorry, okay. Uh, project status report, I believe uh, planning uh, planner uh, Laura uh, McMoran has a uh, comment on this. Yes, good evening, commissioners. So there's um, four things that are brewing pretty actively or on the verge of um, moving forward significantly. The first is the eight units next to the sheriff station. They received their building permits. You may have noticed they have framing up. And so that is well underway um, in getting forward. The next is um, we've had tenant improvement plans submitted for that commercial space behind Popeyes that was part of that project. And they're looking to have a small international market. Um, the right here where Southwest Tile is, those plans we have got an update for you have been um, going under, and this is a good thing. What we hear is lots of scrutiny with the health department. So there's been revisions and corrections but they are um, seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And that is for a, um, I wanna call it more of a higher end donut shop. Um, and then last, um, the six, the nine unit project on Oak is working on its final map submission requirements. So there were some things to do with that. And sometimes this is, um, you know, there's lots of parties involved and timelines can get um, impacted. So those four have updates. Is there anything else anyone might want information on in, for next month? Uh, Laura, thank you for that. I hope none of those four were the surprises that Sherry was just alluding to. No, we have a better one that's okay. still a surprise. My uh, lips are sealed. So I, I do have one and that's the market, of course, on PCH. You have to wait till Founders Day. Okay, that'll wait. That's a surprise. Okay. Other than that, I have nothing. So let's go down the list. Uh, yeah, Vice Mr. Chair Grant. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Before we move on, because I'm not sure that everybody heard what Laura was saying about Cream Pan. Cream Pan is the name of the business that will be occupying the Southwestern Tile oh, Building, which is about oh, a block okay. north. Yeah, she said it so quickly. I'm sure. Cream Pan. Now, I have not been to one, but let's just look at Lemesis' response. Lemesis, is it good? It's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious. It's called Cream it's Pan. Cream it's Pan. Be the donut shop, quote unquote, for where Southwest Tile. It, it's, it's an like exotic 80, donut. Five location. degrees type thing. Right over here, just down the street. Yeah. My understanding is like an Asian inspired bakery. And Lemesis, they do croissants that are filled with fruit. Put your, put your mic on. Croissants with strawberry filling. That's her favorite. Well, if they have the uh, Boston cream pie bagel, then I think it'll be really good. Oh. Or donut, I'm sorry. It's a Boston cream pie. <laughs> it's, it's, there's a Boston cream pie donut that the Japanese market up in West LA does, and it's like divine. Oh, so. It's going to be dangerous for us all. Yeah, well. Yeah. Do, do okay. we know what's happening with the slip? Um, my understanding is that they are proceeding forward with the, the restaurant, which is located across the street from Burn and Daylight. Right. And so, um, I don't know, Levinson, do you have any further updates on that? Yeah, mm -hmm. we spoke to the no, property owner representative just recently, and they said it's, it's a been a little bit slower than they expected, but there is some progress being made. We're hoping to have an update so that we can include them on our display board for Founders Day. Okay. Oh, thank you. 
Okay, so anyway, going back down the list, so Vice Chair Graff, any questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, Commissioner uh, Dever. Uh, Commissioner uh, Steinbach. Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Commissioner Santos on the big screen. Uh, no questions, sir, thank you. Commissioner Stevens, any other questions? Yeah, Lauren, or I don't know if you can do it, but the, the speaking of the tile shot, their weeds are like four and a half feet tall. In fact, there's a car that you almost can't see anymore because it's been parked there for so long. Can we get that corner cleaned up a little bit? We can, we can refer this to code enforcement. Actually, we can just reach out to the owner directly and okay. ask them to do some, take some maintenance, you know, steps. Yeah, it's looking like a jungle. Thank you. Cars. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. With respect to my vice chair grass comment, um, we have native grasses and we actually trimmed them about two months ago and they grow back like weeds, but they're not weeds, they're actually native grasses. And we just trimmed them again over the weekend. And if you notice in the mix of all, you'll see the plaque from the city of Lomita for my drought resistant garden. So just to, just to give you the heads up, sir. Anyways. But but you didn't notice all the roses in the front, did you? Yeah, okay. You can thank my wife for a lot of that green thumb stuff. Anyway, all right. Uh, who am I missing? Commissioner Thompson, anything? Questions, comments? For uh, Planner Laura? Okay, I'll take that shake of a head as no, okay. That's a no. Okay, all right. I think we are ready to move on to uh, other matters, staff announcements. Uh, anybody have anything from... The city side i assume sherry you're going to answer this as well no i think we've covered enough thank okay. you uh any other planning commission items item number 11 so we'll start off with vice chair graff okay commissioner uh dever commissioner santos uh none thank you okay commissioner steinbach none thank you commissioner stevens commissioner thompson none thank you okay uh, with that note, I do want to thank all the commissioners that participated via the big screen tonight. So we had a full house of commissioners. So thank you guys for that. And uh, item 12, uh, commissioners to attend city council meetings. We've got July 5th. Is that still going to happen with the holiday? I'm assuming it will. And July 19th. I haven't 19th. heard anything to the contrary. Anybody want to take a stab at going to either one of those? I, I will take a July 19th, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, so... So Commissioner Thompson and Graf will be at the 19th meeting. <laughs> Anybody want to take July 5th? I'll take the 5th. Thank you, Commissioner Santos. With that, I would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank Good you, everyone. Meeting. 24 p.m. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you for Good participating. Everybody.